19th and 20th century. She is a lecturer at the University of Pretoria and she is currently doing her PhD looking at Noni Jababu's memoirs in conversation with contemporary life writing. So let's give her a welcome. Good afternoon. How's everyone doing? Good, thanks for coming. Um, as Alefa introduced me, my name's Atan Vile, and um, this is going to be three lectures, so I'm hoping you're going to come to Tuesday and Wednesday, if I don't bore you too much. If you don't, it's okay, I'll understand. Um, so today's going to be an introductory lecture, just kind of giving an overview and trying to locate Noni Jababu within a literary um, tradition and obviously tell you who she is. And then tomorrow I'll bring two of the books um, that she wrote, which are unfortunately unavailable. Um, and I say unavailable in bookshops. I find all the copies that I find in antique bookshops like Ike's and wherever else. And then on Wednesday we'll take a look at her columns, which are also unavailable, but hopefully that's a work in progress. And I'll just bring copies, which we can Read. If people want copies beforehand, you can email me and I'll email them to you. I've got a few copies, but they're about, they're more than 40 columns that she wrote. Um, so this is a picture of her as seen in one of the, I don't know how to do this, it's gonna, um, that you see in her book, um, one of the book flaps. In fact, it's on the back of the Oka people. So I don't want to say too much about her because I just want to, Oh, you've got a copy, yay, oh my gosh. And you've also got a copy. This is so rare. From a used bookshop, yeah. So you never, you know, you don't wanna let anybody touch that because it's a rare find. Oh, that's amazing. Which one do you have? And the other one, and you've got that one. So you've got the 1982 version. Wow, these are like Noni Jawabu fans. I need to be on point. Okay, you just up the stakes for me. I want us to do a quiz quickly before we actually get into the, the lecture. So this is a list of 10 people's names. And I want you to tell me which country they're from. OK, they're all writers, obviously. Which country they're from, what's the title of what they wrote, and give me a range of the years. <laughs> Yeah, okay, that's an easy one. Gunam Shope, yeah? So you're just telling me that you're identifying them. Mm hmm Uh-huh. Can you give me a title? Yes. Yeah. Zimbabwe, okay. Nervous condition, yeah, a classic. Anyone else? Okay, so I mean, this is the point of the, the lecture, I guess. So these are, sorry, this thing, it's weird. I never have, yeah, it's my earrings. I was trying to be cool. Um, so this is a list of 10 black Southern African women with one kind of deviant, if, that, if I can use that word, um, Flora Notha is actually from West Africa. She's a Nigerian writer. So Miriam Gladdy is the first woman to write a novel um, in South Africa in English, to be specific. And she's got two titles, Mur Mural at Metropolitan and um, Footprints in the Quag, which is a collection of short stories. And there's a third one, it's a red book. Now I've forgotten the title, about 1976, I know what it's about, but I've just the titles escaped me. And then Flora Nwapa is the Nigerian woman who I think published, one of the first women actually on the continent, I think, to publish a novel, um, which title, whose titles also escaped me. Um, it's orange on the cover. Um, it's part of the African Writer Series. 
and I think she published as early as the 1950s. And then Adelaide Childs Dube, um, I put her in there, she's not a novelist. Um, she, is, she wrote a poem in 1913. And I like her because she's interesting in the sense that people don't think of her as a writer, and people don't talk about her when they're talking about black women who write, because she wrote a poem. She's famous for one poem that she wrote. I suspect she probably wrote more, and we just never found the stuff that she was writing. So she wrote a poem about land, which I'll, I'll read if we've got time. Loretta Ngobo published in the 19, I think, early 1980s, I think 81, 82, 81, 83, and early 90s. Um, and They Didn't Die, The Cross of Gold, and um, she edited a collection of essays with women in Britain. So she was in South Africa, left, stayed in the UK, was in exile, and then came back later. Nunzi Zimkweto, also another kind of not deviant, but kind of creates a different kind of conversation about black women writing and black women's um, history. Um, and her surname is spelled incorrectly. There's supposed to be a Q in her surname. Um, she wrote poetry in the 1920s. And she became not so much relevant, but she came back into the public imagination in 2007 when Jeff Opland collected all her poems from the newspapers that she used to write in the 1920s. And so you can get a copy, it's uh, published by Wits Press. You can get a copy of her collection of poetry. And then Victoria Swatboy is virtually an unknown. She wrote the first novel in Isklosa called Umandisa, which was supposed to be like a novelette of sorts, a very short book. We have no copy of it. Um, it was probably printed by Lovedale Press, which no longer exists. And that would have been in the 19. 30s or 1940s, but very, very early. And then there's Phyllis Ndandana that someone mentioned. She wrote Life's Mosaic. She, I didn't write her, this is how she writes her name on, on her book, but she's famous for being A.C. Jordan's wife and helped translate into The Wrath of the Ancestors. So you'll find her name in small print in The Wrath of the Ancestors, not on the front cover. And then there's Bessie Head, who I don't need to say much about. And Gunam I put her in as well because she's a poet, she's a writer, but she's also in the public imagination more than any of these women, and is a far more contemporary writer. And there's Zizi Dangaremba, <coughs> excuse me, who's a Zimbabwean writer in Nervous Conditions, The Book of Not. She's also a filmmaker. The list is endless, right? I could have given you a far longer list. But I guess the point of this, or starting with this, was how very little we know about black women as writers. And the interest for me came when a lecturer during my undergrad said to me, there aren't many black women writers. He said it to me, my face. And I was like, that's odd. Um, and it really was a frustration for me. Um, and it's significant that it's said by a white academic at a South African university, at a former white liberal university. Um, and at the time, um, I was doing my undergrad, I was majoring in English, and so I was in the English department kind of looking at the text that we were, we were doing, and it was, I mean, the usual narrative of being uncomfortable, about not feeling represented, blah, blah, blah. And, but the, the kind of certainty with which he said, you know, black women don't write. Um, and so that forced me to, A, want to prove him wrong, and also just question my own cognitive dissonance about wanting and feeling like I want to be a writer, and having a hunch that I think this has been done before. I didn't like the feeling of, um, you know, the firsts. That the, I mean, this was in the 2000s, so there was no need for us to have been doing this for the first time. It just wasn't possible in my mind, and my imagination wanted me to allow myself to think that black women have been writing before because it's such a core part of our modernity and a core part of South African history. And so when you say that black women aren't writers, you're erasing a whole lot. And so for me, the conversation became about erasure and how we think about who gets to contribute to the grand narrative of South Africa. Um, and so the history goes, and oh, then I found this book, um, which is a bit of a Bible and also another one that's quite difficult to find. Wits apparently only, Wits Press only has about 60 or 60 copies left, and they found them in a dungeon somewhere. So they're not even available. Or maybe I lie, African Flavor Books had some copies. So they had this, and you have the Southern region, you have the Eastern region, and the Western region. And their whole plan was to respond to this very question, that in fact, black women 
are writers, but the question was, what do we consider as writing that is credible? So who gets to become a writer? And the question of literacy. So if we're saying black women aren't writing, are they contributing to the intellectual project in different ways? And so what they do is say, well, we can find a whole lot of um, oral history and oral literacy that tells us that women were present and women were um, telling us stories and women were documenting themselves along the way. Yeah? The title, oh. Sure. Okay. It's Women Writing Africa. And it comes in the southern region, the eastern region, and the western region. It's three different books. And I think they were working on the northern region, but you can imagine the challenges with the northern region. You've got language issues. It would have probably been, um, what am I saying? Some Arabic. And, um, and most of the women I think who were working on this project were women from southern Africa. Um, and it's edited by a whole lot of people. We can just come take a picture at the end, maybe. So the way that I think about um, why this is important for me beyond the intellectual project, but also beyond, um, and so partly for me it's both the political project, but it's also a personal project as someone who is now a writer or sees themselves as a writer, but also wanting to teach and um, think about who gets to have a voice in our classrooms, or in our, yeah, in our classrooms, in our lecture theaters. So there's a lovely book by a woman called Brittany Cooper, and sorry, I'm not really, I don't like long quotes, but I wanted the whole quote there, so just bear with me, it doesn't happen a lot. And um, she writes about her book, Beyond Respectability, the intellectual thought, the intellectual thought of race women. So she looks at the early race, what she calls race women, in relation to the race men in the African American trajectory. And she says, well, while there was Booker T. Washington, and we can name all the names, and W.E.B. Du Bois, we don't think about other black women who were in conversation with those men. So the very conversation that I'm having, or we're having in South Africa about where are women located in the intellectual history, there are women in, um, in America who are having the same conversation. And so she tracks women from the late 1800s to the early 1900s. And she says the women used to do these very interesting things. And I think in South Africa, we, um, women did the exact same things, especially when newspapers became a, a, a popular medium. So they used to create lists for themselves. And so I imagine it would be in the social section of the newspaper, and they create lists of who's doing what, and who's saying, or who's writing what. And she um, talks about this as listing. And so she says they, they used to list their own genealogies of black women thinkers. I did not think of these lists as mere lists. Instead, the intentional calling of names created an intellectual genealogy of race women's work and was a practice of resistance against the intellectual erasure. So women themselves knew that if they don't list each other's names, they are not going to be seen. That it was a project that they had to actively do for themselves in order for them to resist erasure. And so this is what she calls listing. So she says, these lists situate black women within a long lineage of prior women who have done similar work, kinds of work. So she's talking about her work, that she's now also contributing to this kind of idea of listing these black women. Um, so it contributes, let me start again. These lists situate black women within a long lineage of prior women who have done similar kinds of work and naming those women grants intellectual, political, and or cultural legitimacy to the black women speaking their names. Listing also refers in the fashion industry to an edge produced on a piece of fabric and applied to a seam to prevent it from unraveling. In similar fashion, black women's long traditions of intellectual production constitute a critical edge, without which the broader history of African-American knowledge production would unravel and come apart at the seams. And I really like this idea of listing because it then says, while they may be on the margins, and this idea of the, the fashion industry, that it's the same word, while black women are on the margins, they are in fact holding everything together. It's that you cannot understand an intellectual history without thinking about black women's writing or black women's political work or black women's cultural work. And so it holds the whole thing together. And so part of the work that I've been discovering is thinking of what would it mean if we saw a Charlotte Maplake in conversation with a Pixley Gassen. Because what happens was, well, what did happen is, well, Manning Mulunga writes a biography about Pixley Kassem, and I read it, and there's absolutely, there's very few mention of women whom he would have been in conversation with. So the one primary woman that he links Seme to 
is Quinn Lobazeni from the, the Eswati because he was doing some legal work for them. But it seems in my mind odd that you wouldn't talk about who else was, I mean, so Seme and those guys were, the guys had gone to America, right? And there's a small group of black intellectuals, which we now call intellectuals, who had gone and studied abroad. So I imagine in my mind, these guys know about each other. They know who's writing what, they know who's doing what. Why isn't he talking about Smusisiwe Makanya, who was a woman who had also gone to um, Ohio and studied at Wilberforce? Why is he not talking about Charlotte McLeaga? So there's absolutely no sense that these men and women were in conversation with each other, even though um, Campbell, who writes the history of the AME Church, which Charlotte McLeaga is very central to writing about, shows her up in conversation with these men, that in fact it was her letters that had people from South Africa go to the US and vice versa to think about this idea of what it would mean to have the AME Church. So for me, listing is about putting everybody into conversation and saying you cannot, this kind of idea of heroism and building up these caricatures or these images of these great race men, which was happening in America as well, we actually do the same in South African history as well. So then I take it a step further in terms of thinking about what does it mean for me as a young black woman in 2018, 2019, doing this work, and what it means to think of the idea of listing. And I like the idea of Uguzlanda, which is a Kosa word, um, I'm Kosa, which is a Kosa word which I think would appear in across um, a couple of African traditions, this idea of when somebody asks you who you are, they then ask for your lineage, so that you don't appear as an individual, you appear as part of people in conversation. So I like this idea where in African discourse, memory is an act of Uguzilanda, and this kind of literary historiography work is, an, is a memory work. So where you fetch oneself and connect oneself to the past in the present moment. So for me, talking about black women's writing and intellectual labor, and the long list of women who are still not part of the public imagination or general knowledge amongst our children is an act of Uguzilanda. And a lot of South African women who I've started reading uh, are doing the same thing. They think of themselves and they write about themselves in relation to other women, in relation to other people. So again, it, for me, questions this idea of the need to create these grand narratives about these race men or these big men in history, which is obviously something people have been writing about, um, especially in um, South African historiography as well. So I'm not doing anything new, but I like this idea because it almost grounds it within a practice that is familiar, that says no one has the privilege, or perhaps some people believe that they don't have the privilege of talking about themselves as individuals, is that you can only locate yourself in relation to other people, which then it's weird for me when we don't think of Noni Jababu as being part of the literary history in South Africa and how she's been erased, even though she too comes from a literary tradition, which I'd like to think we can trace to South Africa, even though she's a more global character. And I'll still get to her biography in a sense. So I've spoken about the book um, and this issue of erasure of women's intellectual contributions. So this is the question I ask myself, is that how do we recognize women's voices fully? especially in light of oral history. So the cool thing that this book really does is most of the texts that are in this book are actually transcribed. So they take oral texts, or not oral texts in a sense, but texts that have been recorded. So someone like Louisa Mvembe, for example, whom they profile in here, she was a healer, she was semi-literate, um, and so she had somebody else write her letters for her. But she used literacy and the knowledge that if you want to be seen in this transition from um, an oral community into one that requires you to write letters and to petition your position because she wasn't allowed to practice in certain places, is that you then have to participate in the process of writing. And so that's how you then show up in history. Um, the, okay, I'm going to keep saying the cool thing, but the other thing is that it then challenges this idea because we know the power of oral history. Um, if we talk about, Zulu people talk about is tagazelo or plus people talk about is it Dugo, clan names, is that that's a way of keeping women's histories and genealogies alive. So this idea that there's perhaps a tension between the orality and written text is something that people have been writing about and questioning for many, many years. So a lot of the things that I'm saying and I, I think about aren't new for me, but they've just been interesting in terms of how they then show up again 
for us, especially if we're going to have a conversation about what it means to decolonize, because that's also part of the conversation. So the earliest text in this book is 1842. Um, yeah. And so just these are some quotes from the, from the introduction of this book. So our focus is on women. And in broad terms, we aim to redress what is generally recognized as an imbalance in Southern African literary and historical anthologies and accounts, given that male writers and performers have been more widely published than women, and that historical agency is taken to be male. So no one's taking away from the fact that men, because of patriarchy, because of white supremacy, and all those things, that they get more space in what we think of as history and the way that history has been written about. Um, and so the book is in response to that, and it, it builds a conversation about what does it mean to, for people to have historical agency. What's been biz not biz yeah, I guess what's been bizarre for me is the erasure, in spite of the fact that many women, comparatively, I don't know, I, I can't compare perhaps, um, actually did write themselves into history. So someone like Nunzizim Kweto, who wrote poetry, knew that a Charlotte McGregor was alive, and they were referencing each other in their work. This was in the 1920s. And also, when we start to think about what does it mean, though, for someone like Charlotte McLeaker, whose husband was an editor of a newspaper, to have access to that newspaper, when do we start silencing women? Even though we've got evidence of women as in the early 1920s writing. And if we could go back even a few years before that, there was Daisy Makiwane Majombozi, who was, I see, as the first black woman journalist, who, because she passes her matric, I think at Lovedale, can't do anything because they know universities so she can't do anything further. DDT Jababu then says, come work for my newspaper. And so that's how she ends up kind of working her way through. But of course, we can't talk about this thing without talking about class. So these were also very elite women coming from elite families who had been Christianized. So then it creates another gap of who, why is it that it's only when you're Christianized and missionized that you only get to be seen. And that's why, to go back to Louisa Mveve, she was neither of those things. She was a traditional healer who understood that in order to be seen, she had to participate in something in a particular way. Or we could talk about Emma Sandile and the letters that she writes in order to get her land back, and that process of being at Zunoblom and um, trying to, to make sense of what it means to be dislocated and getting land back, but using letter writing in that whole process. Oh, sorry for the long quotes. I'm going to leave it. Or should I read it? Okay. So this, I guess this is Tony, from Tony Pamukwena's book where she looks at Magia Mafuze, who was one of the early intellectuals in, um, in Natal, KZN now. And so she talks about the fraught history of intellectual life in South Africa, which kind of brings up all these issues of class, of gender, of um, accessibility. The history of writing as a vocation in South Africa is as complicated as the history of the country itself. There are simply no neutral terms by which to designate the literary, political, and historical writing produced in South Africa over the last three centuries. South Africa's culture of letters cannot be divorced from the history of conquest, subjugation, exclusion, and marginalization. For African literates of the 19th century, the confluence of the forces of, of evangelical activity, modernity, and literacy meant that when a writer did become aware of this conflicted condition, it became an occasion for questioning not only the implications of literacy, but also the extent to which literates understood the changes that had taken place in their society of origins. So a lot of the early intellectuals, people like Dioso, Ga, um, the Magia Mafuzes understood what the printing press meant for themselves and the kind of how they then subverted what the missionaries were trying to do because then as soon as they became literate, they then started writing their own um, texts in conversation with what the missionaries were saying and who were trying to, um, what's the word when you don't want people to publish something? Censor their ideas. And so the two then become um, it, it, you realize that the, 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 there's a confliction. And it's almost like they didn't expect it. It's the irony that you use the very thing that was used against you to then um, put yourself in a position of agency or power. Um, and I, I think black women did the same thing, that when they realized that, that newspapers were becoming a free-for-all, they then did the same thing, in spite of the fact that there were articles being printed uh, by black men saying what black women should or shouldn't do. So there's an interesting article in 1935 by H.E.I. Domo where he writes about Bandu, Bandu womanhood. 
But he's not, ooh, excuse me, not necessarily saying they shouldn't write or shouldn't be public, but he's got a very particular idea of what black womanhood is supposed to look like. And then you've got all these women who are writing in the social pages of the Bandu world, um, kind of in conversation with that, either writing under, under pseudonyms or writing in their own names, again, asserting their stories and asserting their voices through the newspaper. So newspaper history is very, very interesting, um, and maybe it's something we'll come back to. So I guess we're talking, I've spoken about class and the issue of um, who gets to show up, that if you're, you were missionized or you were Christianized or you were elite, and I think perhaps it's a conversation I'm still having with myself. There is this assumption that if you were Christianized, you immediately became elite. I don't think that was the case with everybody. And obviously, there are variations to which people participated in what it meant to be a Christian in the early years. So then we have to ask about um, elitism and what that meant then. And some people are often saying you can't even call the early intellectuals black middle class because it wasn't available to them. But when you hear about Noni Jababu's family, you're just like, they're not even black middle class. They're just like something else altogether. And they shared that with a few other families. So class is a really interesting thing, and I'm still thinking through some of those ideas. And then the question of visibility, hypervisibility, who do we see? And what enables us to see um, who's credible and whose voice matters? And I think that's an age-old question insofar as modernity um, and how it happens in the South African historical moments. And then form. Um, Again, you know, um, if someone writes a novel, we tend to see them. What, but if someone is a poet, we don't tend to see them. So form also plays into um, how we think about intellectual history or how we think about intellectual labor um, and who. And that's why orality is such a contested thing in the relationship between orality and writing. So because I have it here, I'm going to read um, Adelaide Tanzi's poem which I think is really cool. Um, and if there are comments, I don't know, we can do quick questions and comments at the end um, if people are, have got some thoughts on the poem. Um, where is it? So she's significant because she also studied abroad but we hardly ever hear or, um, um, yeah, she's not linked into the, into the conversation. And Dube is a giveaway. She was married to Langalibalele Dube's son or brother. Let me find it quickly so I give you the right information. But she was part of the Dube family. She married into the Dube family. Yeah, she married Charles Dube, the younger son of John Dube. And so this is published in Ilanga, I think and it is written in English. How beautiful are thy hills and thy dales. I love thy very atmosphere so sweet. Thy trees adorn the landscape rough and steep. No other country in the whole world could with thee compare. It is here where our noble ancestors experienced joys of dear ones and of home, where great and glorious kingdoms rose and fell, where blood was shed to save thee, thou dearest land ever known. But alas, their efforts were all in vain, for today others claim thee as their own. No longer can their offspring cherish thee, no land to call their own, but outcasts in their own country. Despair of thee I never, never will. Struggle I must for freedom, God's great gift, till every drop of blood within my veins shall dry upon my troubled bones. O oh, thou dearest native land. So, just listening to it, and you can see it in form as well in the book, what does it sound like? Yeah, so it's, it's political in content. In terms of style, any thoughts? Mm -hmm. Can you say more? Yeah, it does have a familiar sound to it, but also comes from a particular kind of tradition. So the rhyme scheme. You can tell that this is someone who is educated in a particular tradition and thinks of form in a particular way. 
and the language that she uses, I guess, I don't know if it was familiar, I mean, for the time, so she uses thy and thee. And I don't imagine anyone was speaking in that way, but she knows that in writing, if you're writing a particular kind of looking poem, is that you use that kind of language, Shakespeare and the early canon and, and so on, it's that kind of influence. So I really like that poem though, because it is in exactly that, it's very political. But we don't see it show up even in the current conversation about land. So in Tembega, I haven't read Tembega's book, by the way, Mkai told me. I'd be interested when I do eventually read it if he references her as someone who was thinking about the political question of the land. Um, he writes about other women who were wives to these men who were using the constitution or using law at the time, not so much the constitution, but using law at the time to address the land question. But just ideologically or culturally, what did it mean for a black woman to have written that kind of poem and saying directly that your land, our land has been stolen, but we will never stop fighting for the land in a sense. Okay, so just to talk a bit about um, Noni Jabavu, um, and it's great we've got some fans who've got books, so chip in if I miss something. So Noni Jabavu for me appears in, when I am in third year, fourth year. And this is significant because the story all kind of overlaps very nicely. So I'm a university student, I'm thinking about being a writer, what this means, why can't I find people who look like me, possibly share my ideas or experiences in the stuff that I'm reading. And so it also, inter yeah, also interconnects with me starting to do is closer for the first time in my education. So I had high school, and previously I'd done Afrikaans as an additional language, and never done is closer, because I was like, I know how to speak is closer, which is a lie. So I then discover is closer all of a sudden, and especially in an academic context. So I was in my third year, and they introduced is closer as at mother tongue level, because up until then, is closer, like most African languages in most universities, or most previously white universities, was introduced at a non-mother tongue level. So it's introduced at a mother tongue level and literally opens up a whole new world of literature for me. I was just like, what? They were doing this in their own language? This is amazing. So I start writing and the first publication, well, publication as such that I write for is the Daily Dispatch. And so I'm putting op-eds in the Daily Dispatch, you know, people are reading my stuff and becoming quite popular. And I'm not enjoying the popularity because I'm like, why is this such a big deal? Surely black women have been writing for this newspaper since forever and ever. People are like, yeah, oh, no, maybe. And at the time, I could only count maybe about four or five people, even less, who were contributing to the paper at the time. So I get really upset about this, and so I start researching literally on Google black women writers, black women writers in South Africa. And so these lists start appearing. And that's how I find Noni Jabab is that Around that time, it collides with Kose Kwaba, Makosaza Nakwaba, doing her master's in creative writing on Noni Jababu. So had she not been doing her master's around the same time, I wouldn't have actually found information on her because pretty much most of the information that starts appearing is written by her. So she publishes her master's, I think, in 2008. And she then, th that's when the information finds out that Noni Jababu had been writing columns in 1977 in the Daily Dispatch. And so then I'm curious about, well, who was she and why was she writing columns in 1977? So it turns out she came from a famous Jababu family. So any self-respecting child from the Eastern Cape knows about the Jababu. So the name kind of twigged a thing, but I'd only ever associated it with the men. And so she, it turns out that she had written two books, The Oka People and Drawn in Color. But what's interesting is that she publishes those books not while she's in South Africa. So when she was 13 years old, she had gone abroad to finish her education, which apparently was a thing in her family. So her father had studied abroad, her mother had studied music in Birmingham, her mother is a Magiwane, her father is a Jababu. So they are third generation Christianized, missionized, literate elite. And uh, so she writes these books. The first one comes out in 1960. The second one comes out in 1963. And they're both published while she's living in London, Jamaica, Botswana, Uganda, Kenya. And the book flaps kind of give a really nice litany, like a litany of all the countries that she's lived in by the time both those books are published. But I don't find the actual books. I just know that there are these two titles. And the Oka people was then published in South Africa for the first time in 1982, which is the version that you have. And she writes a beautiful introduction in that book. Um, and so I can't find these books. So it still feels a bit weird. Why would this person have written these books, but we can't find them anywhere? And what's this business of not being able to find anything? And so 
I find her first book by complete fluke. I'd gone to a writing retreat at a monastery just outside Grahamstown, and they had a library there. And I'm wandering around in the library. Well, it's not even in the library, just a few shelves. I'm wandering around amongst the shelves, and lo and behold, I find the Oka people in the most unlikely place. So I convinced the brothers to give me the copy of the book, and I promised that I'm going to take it back. It was a really hard decision. So I thought, oh, no. And so I read the book, and it's strange and fascinating because it writes about a world that I obviously am unfamiliar with. But in the Oka people in particular, she does a very interesting thing with language. So this is someone who had left the country, become very English in her mannerisms and in her way of speaking, but is quite hell-bent on writing about what it means to then come home as an adult. So both the books are about her coming home, the first one for her brother's funeral, and the second one just for a visit, I think a few months after her brother's death. And so um, she lives all over the world. It's very difficult to trace her. And um, the only way, well, what course is published so far, especially in her master's, is about what it meant for her to be uh, a literary, an editor of a literary magazine. So her career is also quite interesting in that because she left when she was 13 years old and um, had studied at uh, a school in York, a very posh Quaker school in York, uh, stays in England and was supposed to come back, but the war gets in the way, Second World War. So she can't come back home, and so she eventually she, she decides to stay in the UK, gets married, I think first husband dies in the war, gets married again, gets divorced, gets married again, and marries a Cadbury, the Cadbury, um, which is a big deal, well, Crossfield Cadbury, um, which is a big deal because she marries him because he came from the family that her grandfather and his grandfather had been friends. Now, how does a Jababu from South Africa become friends with the elite Cadburys in the UK? And so it's all about the politics of what it meant for a Jababu to have gone to England with the deputation of the 1912, um, just before the SANNC comes into um, reality. And he was part of the deputation. And she calls them a Cape liberal. And because of her grandfather's, is her father a grandfather? Why am I getting confused? I'm going to pick on you because it was a father. Thank you. I was looking at Brian Willem because I know who he is. Um, kind of, they link because of the same politics and become friends. And they exchange letters and they exchange ideas. And so it's not a surprise that a Jababa would marry a Cadbury Crossfield across borders, in a sense. Um, and so she becomes the editor of a literary magazine called The New Strand. And it's called The New Strand because it had been called The Strand and then kind of died and then she was supposed to resuscitate it. Um, and they're beautiful pictures, maybe I'll get to them just now, of how Ebony Magazine, which is in America, does a whole beautiful profile about the new editor at The Strand Magazine. And she's glorious. She, there are pictures of her with horses and a car and her life in London. So you get the sense that this woman is a really big deal, both in America, if you think of the African-American politics in the 60s, as well as in the UK, because she's the first black woman, or the first woman to be the editor of quite a, I wouldn't say conservative, but maybe highbrow um, literary magazine. And so she becomes an editor for that. So 1960, 1959 and 1960, I think she becomes the editor, and then her first book comes out, and then her second book comes out in 1963. So it's linked, is that people would have known who she was. Her first book gets translated into Italian, because maybe she's got friends in Italy. She talks about going to a villa. She lives in Jamaica for a spell. She lives in Uganda for a spell, because her husband at the time is a filmmaker who's going around doing films in the colonial countries, the, in the, what do you call them, empire at the time, the world was breaking down. Um, and so she moves around, and she only comes back to Africa to kind of stay after her marriage with Michael Cadbury Crossfield breaks down. And in the 1980s, she ends up in Zimbabwe. So the version you have, she writes that introduction, and she signs off Zimbabwe. So she's living in Zimbabwe at the time. I can't remember how she ends up in Zimbabwe. And she's basically saying, well, I've been a, oh, she's not allowed to stay in England, part of the alimony or the, the, the divorce agreement between her and Michael Cadbury Crossfield, so she can't stay in the UK anymore. She needs to go find some other country to stay. So question mark, what was happening there? We don't know yet. So she ends up in Zimbabwe. She um, writes for the Herald, the newspaper in Zimbabwe. And 
um, starts itching to wanting to come home, but can't. And so, sorry, I'm not telling the story properly. The 1977 columns happen because she is hurtful and she's actually decided she wants to come home now. But she gets to immigration and she's told, sorry, you're not from here anymore because she's got a British passport and South Africa is no longer part of the Commonwealth at the time. So they tell her, actually, you're a foreigner. You can't actually be here. So she's like, but this is a country where I was born. I can trace myself. And so she does this thing where a few months she'll be in South Africa, a few months she'll be in the Sky, a few months she'll be in Uganda, a few months she'll come back. And at the time, she was actually based at Rhodes and trying to write her father's biography. Um, and there's people who can vouch for the fact that she was there for that year. I think they'd given her a residency of sorts. So 1977 happens, so, but she's doing this splitting around and then eventually settles in Zimbabwe and then only comes back to South Africa in 2008. Was that when she dies? I must check, sorry. Um, she comes back, no one really knows that she's come back. Kosi says she gets an email from some other writing woman who says, hey, Noni Jababu's coming home, let's go meet her at the airport, but Kosi's out of the country at the time, so she's like, oh, I can't come, um, you know, let's make another plan. Um, and so that's how we eventually discover that she's back, she gets an award, I think Order of the Bronze or something or the other, and um, ends up in an old age home in East London, which is close to her home, which was, would have been Alice Siskai, what she writes as the guy, which doesn't exist because it was a homeland. But settles in East London and um, passes away there. She finds relatives, or relatives find her, because I think it's announced in the Smalling Yana article somewhere, that um, she's back, and the, the family who do find her, the only Jababus who are known in East London, are two brothers, um, about my age, but no one can quite trace which line of the Jababus they are, but they're convinced that they're part of, they some way, they link back to the Jababus. Um, and so we're in the process of trying to get her two books republished, um, and it's been difficult because who do we ask for permission? So John Murray says, no, she took her rights, so we can't actually help you with anything. It was also actually printed in America under what is now Pan Macmillan, and so no one really knows how to find it. So these two brothers have now created a family trust, and that's the only way we'll hopefully get her books republished because they'll put all the money in a family trust so no one fights over the money, and hopefully that's where we are. So I'm going to stop there. Maybe for some questions, because I've been told to stop at two o'clock. sure if she studied it. I mean, I imagine it would have been part of her life because her father was a professor in Latin and is closer. But in the author's note of one of the books, she writes about, she references um, an academic, a white academic. Can, do you mind if I, I think it's the first one. Yes, the first one, yeah. This one. So she says, may I have a word surreptitiously with Kosa speaking readers, bite their ear as we say. Now the expression bite their ear is usually one on dead. So she's like literally translated the words. Um, the present orthography of the language came into general use after I had learned its predecessor and I have never become reconciled to it. I dislike the appearance of the symbols like TH for the aspirated T, marks for tone, pitch, double vowels and plural noun prefixes, verb tenses, demonstratives, ideophones, and so on. So that sounds like someone who's a linguist um, and is quite detailed about what language should look like. So there's always been a discussion of when, how do we indicate when we say, so the difference between ta-ta and da-ta. Typically they sound, well they sound the same, but they don't. But how do you indicate that the one means to take ta-ta or ta-ta, father? So that's what she's kind of referencing. So then she's like, when do you, how do we indicate stresses because the word changes. So the word is spelt exactly the same, but you want to show that it's stressed in a particular way so you know that it means, I can't think of an example right now. 
Tembega and Tembega, how would you indicate? Those are spelt exactly the same, but how do you indicate where the stress should be? So I like a man, yeah, because it's one name, but it, and it means exactly the same thing, but how do you indicate who it's for and what it means? Well, not what it means, but the, 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 the meaning of it. And then she goes on to say, this, this is the reason why, where I have written out a closer sentence, my spelling is erratic. I'm among those who are eating with the old-fashioned spoon, and she puts that in italics, which means I'm old-fashioned. So she's again translating literally from Isthos, word for word. Who believe that for languages so dominantly vocalic in character, and she's quoting a professor, J.P. Lestrade, describe the group to which Kosa belongs, nothing short of a new script should be devised. The Roman is not suitable and will always make for troublesome and ugly reading or writing. And may I ask English-speaking readers also to forgive me in their turn. For I have here and there unconsciously inflected a word according to Kosa rules in trying to convey an, a non-English thought. When my publisher's reader pointed out that it was an invented construction, excuse me, I decided to risk letting it remain because it seemed to me that the new word came closer to the meaning I hoped to render than one which would have been grammatically correct. So there's no sense of, you know, did she study it further, but she's clearly very passionate about, in particular about what language should look like. And I like that because it immediately suggests something about who this woman was, that she wasn't just writing for the sake of writing. Sorry, I want to read the second one as well. Um, she's very particular, and I think, I, I mean, I can't tell, there hasn't been anything in Kosi's um, research that she says, because she studied music, actually, like her mother who had studied music. Um, and then this one is also quite nice because um, she hates herself. So she's, in that one, she's quite particular about language. But in this one, she's very particular about her identity. So she says, I belong to two worlds with two loyalties, South Africa, where I was born, and England, where I was educated. When I received a cable sent by my father from my home in South Africa, I flew back there to be amongst my Bantu people, leaving my English husband back behind in London. Later that year, he and I went to live in East Africa to be near my only sister who had married out there. I have told her something of my own background and circumstances, since this is a personal account of an individual African's experiences and impressions of the differences between East and South Africa in their contact with Westernization. So again, someone's very particular and almost saying, you know, look, I'm black, but I'm also English. And this is what I'm trying to navigate in my story. So for me, she becomes a really interesting um, character because how do we then place her if we say black women only start writing in the 1970s in South Africa? So literally, that's what people are writing when they write about how, when, and when black women show up. So because her book is then um, only published in 1982, she then becomes a generation of the 80s. And everyone's like, uh, but no. But it's uncomfortable because no one wants to talk about the fact that she was in London, or she didn't fit into the narrative, or she wasn't political enough, or she was too English. Um, so she's a, an interesting and complicated character for me in that sense. Okay. Any other questions? Mm, and then I'll take any. Yeah. Absolutely, and she writes very lovingly about the kind of work that her father was still doing even when he was retired. So, yeah, maybe it was just something that, I mean, of course, we say, that she suckled from a bosom, you know, that just by virtue of you being in that environment, it becomes your thing. Yeah, definitely. Oh, sorry, I was pointing someone behind you. Yeah? Her books. Any book.
oh, now I feel like I'm going to fall into it because if I say yes, I'm being elitist <laughs> in the way that you framed it. Um, yes and no. I think um, for me, having seen the, 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 the consequences of children who are illiterate, I think I would say they're still very relevant because we know that there are children who still don't have access to it and we don't know why they don't have access to books for a variety of reasons. But if you are, and because we live in such a divided society, if you are in the digital age in a sense, you're reading from a Kindle, you're reading online, you're reading, a, there's, a, there's a very specific literary traditions that are happening right now. Um, so I think that's, again, goes back to questions of class, visibility, and form, how you access them. So it's, it's all based on who has access to what. But for me, in my life right now, they're definitely relevant. And I think it's the reason why we're so hell-bent on getting her books published is that it's also evidence. There's something about us as humans want to see it. So the joy of seeing an, an old newspaper article that was published in 1920, there's something that it does about how we think about history that it's something that is something that you can see, feel, and touch. And what would it mean if we didn't reprint these books for young people in 20, 30 years' time? There's, that it cuts out a whole tradition, or it cuts out a whole chunk of ideas. So yeah, I'm in two minds about it. Yeah. Yeah, I'm so glad you asked that question. It gets me really excited. So the South African response is really interesting. So there's a wonderful article by, I say wonderful, it's actually an amazing article, by none other than Dennis Brutus. So he finds a couple of her editorials from the news brand, and he completely writes her off. So the title of the article is The New Un-African. So if you think around the time, this idea of the new African, um, that the Romos were making popular and the Villarreal were like, look at us, we're suave, we're modern, we're writers, we are the new vision of the Africa that is going to come post-colonialism. And he says, oh my gosh, have you read this woman? Who is she? Why is she writing like this? I hate everything that she's written. And so he talks about, I think, the first book. And then, because Dennis Brutus had been at Forte, knows the father, he was like, mm, he was a bit of an Uncle Tom. Um, and so he completely writes her off. And that's the only uh, text that I found. And I mean, being a political activist comes from a particular tradition. Um, would, we could assume that, of course, he would say something like that. Of course, he would write her off. But when we look at who she uh, acknowledges in her books, so I mean, she's family with the, the Matthews, the Magiwan is the, I think she had a readership. She would have had a readership. So her family would have been very proud of the fact that she's following in the footsteps of uh, her forefathers, in a sense, but the tone is just very off. So that's the only um, sort of at the time when she was publishing. That's the only text I found. And then I guess we would have to think about what who was writing about her in the 1980s or 1982 onwards, when they when um, the Oka people came out in 1982. And I've only found I think an article in the Rand Daily Mail that kind of just does a profile. So it doesn't kind of go deep into the texture of her work. And I think that's part of just like not taking her seriously because of her tone, because she's a woman, I suspect. Um, but the international audience, I think, loved her. So there's the Ebony, um, Ebony Magazine example, which I was going to show you tomorrow, but seeing as we're having a conversation. Oh, the timeline is all right there. Haha. -ha. I didn't have to bundle it up. So you. She's on the cover of um, another magazine. Um, there was the 1962 Ebony magazine, and this is what the, the spread looks like. And then, of course, um, it gets published in, it gets translated into Italian, and it gets published in America, and she goes to America and does a bit of a book tour. And the, what I love about these book jackets is that, they tell us what people were saying. So what the press said. One of the most interesting books ever written by an African. 
for anyone who wants to hear a most sophisticated Bantu point of view, perceptively put, this is a must. And that's from the Times. A diamond of a book whose intense sparkle shows us more of Africa than a whole array of documentary searchlights from the Daily Telegraph.